visibly and verbally honoring him, not just in public, but in private, not just in the church house, but in your house, not just so other people can hear it, but so he can hear it and see it. And that is what God has called us to, for God to begin to work and bring about the kind of relationships that can turn things around. Hello, Tony Evans back with you again here at The Urban Alternative. And today we're going to talk about what it means to become a kingdom wife. You know if you keep up with me or the ministry that we're kingdom oriented, coming underneath the rule of God. What does it look like when a wife comes under the rule of God? And how does that benefit her and those around her in her own family? And how do you not be abused when you become a kingdom wife? You know, this is a very special message for every lady who is a wife or whoever hopes to be one. And so let's go to God's word and find out what a kingdom wife looks like. The reason God created family, the foundational institution in society, was for the advancement of his kingdom in history. It was a kingdom purpose. And to subdue the earth, that is, oversee the earth on his behalf, through the family structure and its replication, be fruitful and multiply, throughout the earth, replicating the image of God, everywhere children would establish new families. So the advancement of God's kingdom through family, therefore marriage, the centerpiece of family, was the reason God created it. But because that purpose has been lost and personal happiness has become the driving force when people are no longer happy because they're not connected to the purpose, then they want to no longer be part of the institution. So my first concern is that we get back to the biblical purpose for family, the advancement of God's kingdom in history through the marriage of a man and a woman. But even if you have the biblical purpose of family, you may not be organized according to God's structure for family. If you've been following me, you've known that he says marriage is a covenant and within that covenant there is a structure and God always works through his ordained structure. In other words, you cannot get God's involvement if you create your own structure. So God has a structure by which this institution in history is to operate. God always starts with the man. Is if the home is out of order, we have to first ask, is the man out of alignment? Is the man out of alignment? If a man is not subordinated to Christ properly, then Christ is not free to work to him, through him, and in him for the management and ruling of his domain. So the alignment of the man is critical. It's foundational and it's first. But today we want to talk about the alignment of the woman, the wife. When Satan came into the garden, he went to Eve, not Adam, on purpose. He went to Eve because he flipped God's order. Instead of going to the man, he went to the woman. Eve became the leader of the house. Adam became the passive responder. Roles got flipped, all hell broke loose. Whenever roles get flipped, you don't have to invite the devil, he can invite himself. When we are out of alignment with God, when we're out of alignment in our roles, the devil has freedom because he knows God only works inside of his alignment. So he creates disconnections. He creates alignment confusion. So the man is not in his role or the wife 
is not in her role or both are not in their role fulfilling the alignment. Now, let me make this point inextricably clear. This has nothing to do with equality of persons. Jesus is equal to God, but it has everything to do with effectiveness of function. While Jesus is equal to God in his being, he is not equal to God in his function. Jesus said when he came to earth, I have come to do thy will, O God. So what Jesus did was he submitted himself to the Father to carry out his function on earth, while at the same time, Philippians 2, being equal to the Father. So every woman is equal to her husband in her being, but she is not equal to her husband in her function. Now, I know people get that mixed up and take function and make it inequality of being and so treat women like dogs or animals or dishonor them or disrespect them and all of that. The Bible knows nothing of that. That's why the Bible calls a wife a joint heir, an equal partner, but without an equal function. So please make the distinction between equality of being and inequality of function. In other words, everybody doesn't play the same role. Now he says in verse 22 of Ephesians 5, the hated word. Wives, be subject to your own husbands. The word subject means to place oneself under. Place oneself under. So he is literally saying, wives, if you're married, place yourself underneath your husband. Now you'll understand that in a moment. Stick with me. You're equal to him in being, but he's not talking about being. He's talking about functioning in history. When it comes to function, place yourself under your husband. But now I hear the argument. You're saying, but I'm scared. Because if I do that, I don't know what I'm going to wind up with. Well, he puts a limitation on the placement. He says, place yourself under your husband as unto the Lord. He says in verse 23, these words, he says, for the husband is head of the wife as Christ is also head of the church. So he says, he is your head but he is your head like something, like Christ is to the church. He says in verse 24, but as the church is subject to Christ, so wives ought to be subject to their husbands in everything. In other words, every wife, Christian wife, is to be underneath her Christian husband, but with limitations. The limitations are that he cannot go outside of God in demanding your submission. So it is specific, definite submission, placing yourself under, but it is placing yourself under with boundaries. That is, the husband has boundaries as Christ does the church. So yes, you must submit, but you submit, that is, place yourself under with boundaries. When it comes to the marriage, you are to place yourself under that is yield within the boundaries, not outside of the boundaries, within the boundaries of the Lord, which means he cannot demand anything from you that is inconsistent with what Christ demands. So therefore, you can be comfortable that you're not to be a dishcloth, a paper towel. You're not to be used, abused physically or emotionally just because he has the term husband. Because God has put boundaries on that term. But within those boundaries, he says you are to yield in everything. So if he's operating within those boundaries on that issue, you are to yield even though you may be in the marriage, the 18-wheeler, because God has given him the right of way. 
And in fact, you want him to have that because he's going to be the one held ultimately responsible. So he's the one held ultimately responsible. So place yourself underneath. One of the problems we're facing today, yes, men out of alignment, but the other problem we're facing today is women out of alignment. Women who are refusing to honor their husband's, watch this, position. Watch this. Husband is not just a person. Husband is a position. Your husband has a position that is to be honored even when you disagree with the point that he's making. Okay? Because it's a position. So he says, wives, submit to your husbands as to the Lord. Now turn to 1 Corinthians 11 where he breaks this down in more detail. Let's review verse 3. I want you to understand that Christ is the head of every man. Jesus Christ must be able to overrule you. If he can't overrule you, you're not under authority and that carries complications with it. Stick with me. And the man is the head of a woman. And God is the head of Christ. So everybody's under somebody. Christ is under God in function, equal to God in being, under God in function. He says every man is under Christ, so every man is to submit to, but he's submitting to the rule of God through Christ. And then a woman is to slide or come up under the man. That's God's flow in history. Now, he says everybody has a head. A head is a governing authority. That's what that means, a governing authority. But the essence of the head, he uses a word to help us understand it. He uses the word covering. He says in verse 5, but every woman who has her head uncovered. Verse 6, for if a woman does not cover her head. He uses the word covering to describe what headship does. Headship provides a covering. When God was over Christ, God covered Christ. Christ is supposed to cover every man, and a man is supposed to cover a woman. Let me read verse 8. For man does not originate from woman, but woman from man. Verse 7. For a man ought not to have his head covered, since he is the image and glory of God, but the woman is the glory of the man. Now, the, the glory means make something look good. Okay? So, the man's job is to make God look good and the woman's job is to make the man look good. Okay, so everybody's making somebody look good. Now, let, let's get this straight. This is a creation issue, not a culture issue. It's got nothing to do with back in the old days and I'm living in the 21st century. And see, that's, that's what gets us in all these problems. We skip the Bible and jump the culture. It's got nothing to do with culture because he said this has to do with how things were set up originally by the creator. The man did not originate from the woman. God opened up Adam's side, took out the rib, and the woman originated from the man. 1 Timothy 2.13 says the reason why men are to be the final authority in the church, he says, and not women, is he says because Adam was created first before Eve. God did not make Adam and Eve at the same time on purpose. He made Adam first and Eve second because Adam would be responsible and Adam would then take responsibility for Eve and Eve was supposed to come underneath Adam. So the idea is that this is a creation issue. So to fight the issue is to fight creation and to fight creation is to fight creator. God knows what he's doing if you align yourself under his rule. Now, what happens if we wind up with a rebellious wife? What happens to the ladies who are here who says, I don't care what God says. I have no man over me. Uh, and maybe, maybe you have good reason. Maybe, maybe your reason is, I saw what my dad did to my mom, 
and I'm not taking that chance. Or I, my, my dad walked out, and I'm not, I'm not going to risk that. And so it's just that, that it seems risky to do that. Well, remember, first of all, the man has limitations. He can't, he can't be hitting on you, and he can't be putting his hands on you. And I hope we don't have anybody, any man in this church, putting his hands on a woman, okay? You have no right to ever, <laughs> under any circumstances, to aggressively put your, and I say aggressively because you might be saying, well, she's beating me up, okay? But you, the man does not have, nor to brutalize her emotionally as well as physically. But, so, so you may have some things to work through, but that doesn't change God's word. Now let me show you verse 10, and verse 10 is critical. Therefore, the woman ought to have a symbol of authority on her head because of the angels. Therefore, a woman is to have a symbol of authority on her head. And the reason he says you need to be covered, authority over your head, is because of the angels. But he connects angels with authority. What does angels have to do with covering headship and authority? Okay, here it is. Every Christian is assigned an angel. Okay? Hebrews 1.14, I believe it is. Every Christian has an angel assigned to them. Your angel, your invisible angel, every Christian has one, and I know we're working some of them overtime, but every Christian has an angel assigned to them. The job of your angel that's assigned to you is to look out for your well-being on God's behalf. Angels means messenger. So you've got a messenger. That messenger takes instructions from God the Holy Spirit in relationship to you. So flapping around every woman, every Christian, but he's talking about women here, every woman in this place right now is an assigned angel who has the specific responsibility of, uh, of acting on God's behalf for your well-being. But he says that in order for that angel to do his job, you must be underneath the proper authority. If you're not underneath the proper authority, then the angel can't move. To put it another way, if you are a rebellious wife who is refusing to come under legitimate authority, your angel is sitting with its wings folded, unable to act on your behalf because angels will not move unless things are in alignment. They will not receive instruction to act on your behalf unless things are in alignment. So if you are a rebellious wife, a dishonoring wife who is refusing to come under, let me underscore this again, the legitimate authority of your husband, then that means things that God wants to do to act on your behalf will not be done because your angel will not be given instruction to do it. So that means you lose out on divine intervention. So many rebellious wives are blocking God while they're still going to church. Because, because of the angels, there must be authority and covering, which means there must be alignment, legitimately under that which God okays and authorizes. Now, let me say a word about Ephesians 5 again and then we'll go to the last passage. He comes to the end of the chapter, he says in verse 32, this mystery is great, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. In other words, he said, I'm talking about marriage. Now, in heaven, there's no marriage. Okay, when you get raptured up to heaven, there will be no marriage. I know many of you are saying, thank God, okay? <laughs> there will be no marriage. Why won't there be marriage? Because Christ will be with his church. You see, the reason God created marriage for Christians is to model the love of Christ for the church and the response of the church to the love of Christ through submission. Since Jesus will be with his church, there will be no need for the illustration anymore and there will be no desire for the institution anymore. So the, the reason God created marriage was to model his kingdom, something bigger, Christ's relationship to the church. Then he comes in verse 33 and says, nevertheless, 
Each individual among you also is to love his own wife, even as himself. And the wife must see to it. Somebody in here say, see to it. See to it. That is make sure. Make sure that she respects her husband. All right? There is no command in the Bible for a woman to love her husband. There are references of women loving their husbands, but they're not commands. There's a command for a man to love his wife, not a command for a wife to love her husband. The command in verse 33 is that she respects her husband. Because ladies, what your husband needs is not in his heart, it's in his head. That's why the woman will regularly say, I don't believe he loves me. But men will regularly say, I don't believe she respects me. Because what a man is needing, wanting, desiring, and what he feeds off of is respect. To respect means to hold in high esteem. To reverence, to hold up in high esteem. You are to respect your husband. Watch this even when you disagree with him. In the same way, you wives, 1 Peter 3, 1, be submissive to your own husbands so that if any of them are disobedient to the word, they may be won without a word by the behavior of their wives, or let's put it in another way. Don't try to nag them into changing without a word. That means without nagging, Okay. Don't try to nag. You've been trying to nag him for 20 years. He ain't changed yet. So obviously, nagging is not it. He says, the way you affect him is by your submission to him. Legitimate submission. He says, to do this without a word, as they, verse 2, observe your chaste and respectful behavior. In other words, they, they are watching you respect them. They are seeing it. it. It becomes something, it's sight and sound. You are visually recognizing his position as your husband. And he says, you do it first of all in how you look. Look at verse 3. Your adornment must not be merely external, braiding of the hair, wearing gold jewelry, and putting on of dresses. Now, he doesn't say you want to look nice. He says you are not to merely look nice. That is, your beauty should not just be external. So don't come out and, and let it just be for show for everybody else, but he doesn't get to see this respectful behavior at home. He says, in addition to looking good on the outside, you ought to look in the mirror of God's word to make sure you're pretty on the inside. He says he ought to see your respectful behavior. Looking pretty and cussing him out doesn't work. Looking pretty and putting him down doesn't work. Looking pretty and talking about him to your girlfriends like a dog doesn't work. Looking pretty and running him, that, that does not work. He says you are pretty on the outside and ugly on the inside. Because they don't see the respect. He says it ought to be visible. It ought to be seen. Let it be the hidden person of the heart with the imperishable quality of a gentle and quiet spirit He's not talking about not talking. He's talking about a quiet spirit. He's talking about how you come across. He says a quiet spirit which is precious in the sight of God. He says God is looking for the spirit. Is that respectful spirit? Is it an honoring spirit? Yes, he has a responsibility. It's the lead responsibility. We've addressed that. But a woman has a responsibility too to let it be visible that I'm honoring him and recognizing him and supporting him. You are to be his helpmate, not his hurtmate. When you look at the woman in Proverbs 31, she's helping her husband every kind of way. Ministerially, she's helping him with the ministry, she's helping him with real estate, she's helping him with the poor, she's helping him with the kids. She's, she, I mean, this lady's all over the place. She's still looking good because he's dressing in purple, which was the couture of the day. You know, girlfriend's looking good. But the thing that marks her off is it says she feared God. It says she feared God. She took God seriously. Her husband was known in the gates. I mean, none of this ministry would have happened without Sister Evans. No, none of this ministry would have happened without Sister Evan. Everybody knows me, but they don't know all she did behind the scenes. So what God is saying is there must be a spirit that honors your husband 
and it ought to be visual. He ought to see it, not have to guess or search for it. But not only in what he sees, but in what he hears. Look at chapter 3, verse 5. For in this way in former times, the holy women who also hoped in God used to adorn themselves, being submissive to their own husbands, just as Sarah obeyed Abraham, calling him Lord. But when she called Abraham Lord, because that's when she called him Lord, when God said, you're going to have a baby at 90. When she called Abraham Lord, God came back to her and said, now, is anything too impossible for me? So when she called Abraham Lord, she got a miracle. I know you're not trying to have no more babies. That's not the point. The point is... God broke into her messed up situation that had gone on for 90 years and turned that thing around when she respected Abraham. So could you be blocking your miracle because God doesn't see you respecting your husband? God can't sick an angel to your side because he knows you're going to rebel against his office and God's authority because when you rebel against legitimate authority, you are in essence rebelling against God. Today, you should be visibly and verbally honoring him, not just in public but in private, not just in the church house but in your house, not just so other people can hear it but so he can hear it and see it. And that is what God has called us to, for God to begin to work and bring about the kind of relationships that can turn things around. You remember the story Beauty and the Beast. He was an ugly critter. He was a beast. But he ran into a beauty. And for the first time in his life, somebody cared about him. Somebody saw something good in him. Somebody valued him. Somebody honored him. And the beast turned into a prince. You may be married to a beast, but maybe he's just waiting for somebody to honor him, somebody to value him, somebody to treasure him, somebody to encourage him, somebody to believe in him. And maybe your beast will turn into a prince when you come under his legitimate authority. Well, we hope you were challenged, encouraged, inspired by the word of God today. And we have a compilation of messages for women called Wonderful Womanhood. It's designed to encourage and inspire all of you ladies. And you can get this for the lady in your life so that she can be all that God wants her to be and experience all that God wants her to experience. For a gift of any amount to the Urban Alternative, 1-800-800-3222 or log on to TonyEvans.org and we'll get you right away your compilation of messages called Wonderful Womanhood. Thank you for your generous support. We need it to keep ministering the Word of God as we do. God bless you. See you again next time.